So, um, Sally, we are um, really delighted to have you here, particularly as we know that you're uh, at COP and um, contributing hugely to important things there. Yeah, so, um, so the obvious first question, Sally, is given that you're in Glasgow, um, why, I mean, you were there last week as well. So why are you there? What are you trying to achieve? What have you achieved? And, and how does it feel? Well, um, first of all, I'm not quite in Glasgow because there are 30,000 delegates for COP26 and 15,000 rooms in Glasgow. Ah. And so um, actually the reason for my slight lateness is I had to detour to, I'm, I'm on the outskirts of Edinburgh right now. I'm going to Glasgow in the morning, um, but I'm nearly there. I'm nearly there. I'm in the right neck of the woods. Um, so yes, I need to spoil alert. I'm not quite in Glasgow, but you know, not so far away. Um, so what am I trying to achieve? Um, well, uh, a number of things, really. Uh, I mean, clearly, I'm not in the main action where COP is taking place. Uh, there are, I mean, Glasgow is phenomenal right now. There's something called the blue zone, which is where you see all the televised content coming from. That's where Obama was this afternoon. Um, and in the blue zone, there's all these pavilions, so pavilions for nation states, and then... NGOs have these pavilions. I mean, they're not really pavilions, they're just kind of you know, tents, really. Um, and then next to all of this is the negotiation space, which is just massive. So the whole um, setup is about, it's absolutely enormous. So that's the blue zone. And then you've got the green zone, which is where you've got all these funky installations. And last week, I was outside the green zone um, being filmed in an air bubble, which is this structure that is using algae to clean air. Um, and I had to stand in it and do a film and it was really, it's like being in a big bouncy castle, but it was cleaning air. So there's a blue zone, the green zone, and then there's all these side events. Um, so I also did an event in an old engine works. Um, so this was um, looking at climate and health issues. And um, I went for a dinner in a disused railway shed. So all of these kind of uh, you know historical parts of Glasgow have just been temporarily turned over for COP. Um, so my first objective last week was to figure out how to get around Glasgow um, in this kind of sort of madness of all these conferences. But probably um, having thought about this, I think I'm trying to do four things. Um, trying to inspire action and accelerated action. So the um, panel session I was on last week, one of them was looking at the intersection of climate and health and climate change is often talked about as a sort of you know science issue air quality um you know extreme weather events but it actually is a public health issue so climate health is the biggest public health issue we face and Julia will know this um but yet we kind of think about climate and health as sort of two separate issues and what I'm trying to do is to show the linkages because then we might get accelerated action and we've just published guidance for the private sector on how to, de to develop strategies for climate and health. So I'm trying to inspire action by helping people kind of join these issues in, in their minds. Um, and the session that I'm hosting tomorrow in the Blue Zone, so I've got to get myself from Edinburgh to Glasgow into the Blue Zone by, I don't know, some ridiculous time. Um, but we've got a panel session with big manufacturers. So 3M who, um, make many things, but including post-it notes, who knew? Um, and Airbus and then a big electricity provider and then um, General Electric. It's a panel session on looking at how do we decarbonize supply chain? So when you think about climate impacts, you've got your scope one emissions, which is your direct emissions, scope two, which is your transport, and scope three, which is really hard stuff for emissions down supply chain. So running a session tomorrow to try and get accelerated action on that. So I'm trying to inspire action, is what I'm trying to do. Um, I'm also trying to meet new people because I don't know about you, but I haven't met that many new people in the last 20 months, can't think why, I haven't really been anywhere. Um, so trying to meet new people, um, which links to kind of the third thing I'm trying to do as a small nonprofit, we're always trying to fundraise. So again, meeting new people, trying to get funding for the kind of work that we do, like the um, guidance on climate and health. And then the fourth thing I'm trying to do is um, in a kind of sort of, I don't know, spidey way, will an agreement really concentrate hard and will all these negotiators to get us the agreement that we want. Um, 
and do all of that and not get lost and not be too late for things. Well, that's quite a challenge in itself. No mean feat at all. So um, we obviously have lots of questions for you, Sally. Uh, do we want to ask people to put questions on the chat? Yes, that's a good idea. Go on. Yeah, then. so if anybody has a question they want to ask Sally, put it in the chat and, um, and we will sort of... Um, uh, you know, sort of keep an eye on them and, and ask if we run out of time, which if we run out of questions, which I don't think we will. But anyway, yes, yeah, so put your questions in the chat. And we can also always um, put these questions to Sally after the meeting and, and get answers for her and, and send them out to you if we don't have time for them all. So please feel free to do that. So um, question number one then, Sally, is um, I think we'd all need to know really what's the starting point, how bad is it, and why have we ended up in this last chance saloon, basically? Yeah, um, it's pretty bad. Um, this is the truth. Um, so at the moment, our emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, so there's obviously methane, which you heard a lot about last week, um, we're currently on track for a temperature rise by the end of the century of around three and a half degrees centigrade. Food systems that we rely on won't really work at that elevated temperature. It's unclear whether we can actually sustain that temperature rise. What is clear is that if we continue on that trajectory, then at least two billion people will, will die because they won't be able to deal with the extreme weather events. There'll be mass migration. So it's pretty bleak. Um, why are we here? Why are we in a situation where the UN has declared code red? And I was thinking about why we're we here um, on the train and there are so many reasons, but it, in no particular order. And I'll come on to the good bit in a moment because it is it is pretty desperate, but it's it ain't over yet. Um, but why are we here? First and foremost, so actually I have ordered these. Um, is that we've had a lot of private sector players, notably in the oil and gas industry, who have been lobbying for vested interests. So they have been lobbying against the science that has been very clear now for hmm, 10 years, that we're seeing elevated man-made carbon dioxide emissions, which is then precipitating these impacts around our climate. And up until very, very recently, there was extreme lobbying um, against the policy reforms that's needed. So lobbying for vested interests, number one. Uh, number two, availability of capital to invest in the zero carbon transition. That is changing. That's one of the big changes that we've seen over the last 12 months, but there simply hasn't been capital allocated into new technologies at the rate at which they need to be. In many parts of the world, not least in the US, in the last administration, the political will hasn't been there. Um, political has not been strong enough. Um, and then the other, another number four, the science is complicated. If you remember when we first started to talk about climate change, it was global warming because some parts of the world will get warmer. Some parts actually won't get warmer and the, the impacts are complicated. And so that meant communicating this in a really straightforward way was really hard. Um, and then more controversially, um, I think we've kind of focused on the wrong things as well. Um, I don't know if anyone read the article by George Monbiot, was it last weekend? Um, and we're after, are we after the watershed? Not quite, we're after eight o'clock, but he talked about the fact that we've been focused on, these are his words, not mine, micro-consumerist micro bollocks. In other words, we've been focusing on shopping bags and plastic straws where we really need to be focused on where and how is our food grown, where and how are our clothes made. We've also got our proverbial knickers in a knot about aviation. That is really important, but aviation's current contribution to global CO2 emissions is tiny. So we've kind of not focused on the right areas as well. Um, and we're only now beginning to understand the impact of the apparel industry in terms of its carbon footprint. So there are at least five reasons why I think we're in this particular situation. But I, I do think that, I think David Attenborough last week called it desperate hope. I think a lot of us feel that that is true. And certainly with the agreements that are coming through so far, there is a sense of, 
well, we might be able to reduce carbon to get us between 1.5 and 2 degree temperature rise by the end of the century. The Paris Agreement was aiming for 1.5. I think that's really unlikely. However, I think every 0.1 of a degree is really worth fighting for. So if we end up on a trajectory towards 1.6, that is better than 1.7, it's better than 1.8, because climate impacts are ex exponential. Um, so 1.5, I don't think is possible any longer. Two, I think will be really difficult, um, but we may end up somewhere between 1.5 and two. Wow, scary. Really scary. So, um, one of the questions that's come in is um, was was um, highlighting the comments that um, Greta Thunberg was making yesterday. She was very negative, and and apparently there's a poll came out today which said that you know majority of people are not actually prepared to change their lifestyles. I mean, against that background, I mean, so we have governments talking about what to do. I mean, if individuals aren't prepared to change, uh, I mean. Where does that leave us? Well, I think that's a really good question. And it's a complicated question because the reality is that for people in the global south, as it called, in the less developed economies, what are we asking them to change to? They already have a pretty low carbon lifestyle. Um, the reality is that individual lifestyle choices, that's really open to us in the privileged north. Um, but even then, I think we need to remember that a lot of what needs to happen will come through policy and regulation. And I was on a panel. This is my third trip to Scotland in three weeks. It's insane. But I was in Scotland before COP at a pre-COP conference with the chair of the government's climate change committee. Really great guy. And he was saying one of the things we have to do is to shift the narrative. So the narrative is at the moment is that we all have to give something up and someone's going to rip out your gas boilers. Nobody is going to rip out your gas boilers. There will be a managed transition to heating in domestic buildings, which will just be zero carbon and it will happen over 10 years. And so those headlines, if you know someone's going to rip out your boiler, it makes people think, well, oh, my God, even if I was going to do something, I'm not going to do anything now um, because, you know, I'm kind of feeling disempowered and a bit scared. So I think that there is individual action we can all take and we can come on to that. There's lots we can all do. But to be honest, the, the shift that needs to happen won't come from individuals acting alone. It will come from the right policy frameworks, the right political will, the right incentives into the market. It will come from the private sector adopting, which is what they are doing, urgent net zero strategies. It will come from civil society groups, such as Forum, who I work with, kind of putting pressure on the private sector and government. And yes, it will come from us as individuals, but it will come from all of those changes. Because what we're talking about here is the need for a systemic shift, right? We've got an operating system that is fueled by high carbon energy sources. It is serving an economy that in turn is sort of reliant on short-term profit maximization. The goals of the system need to shift from those goals to the goals of an economic system where a primary goal is environmental value creation. A primary goal is societal value creation as well as economic prosperity. That's a big systemic shift and systems change happens when all actors move towards a different set of goals. So, yes, we all have a role to play, but we also need government action, private sector action, civil society action and reframing of capital markets. So that seems like a lot, but we are all part of a bigger change movement. And I think that makes me feel better because it kind of it's not all down to us. It couldn't ever possibly be down to us. That's insane. We also need to remember that there is a huge issue around social justice here. So we don't read about this enough in the papers, but the majority of people impacted hard by climate change, already impacted hard, are the people that didn't create the carbon emissions. That's us here. Um, so we do, all of us, I think, need to think seriously about our sort of lifestyle choices 
but we don't all need to become climate activists. Slowly but surely, our housing stock will change, our mobility will change, infrastructure in cities will change. And, you know, we can either sort of go with that transition and embrace it or kind of dig our heels in, but it's going to happen. So, I mean, you mentioned, um, you know, the, it's, this is something that's going to have to come from government and from business and, you know, from the big players, I guess. Um, I mean, what, one of the, I mean, one of the things you, you often hear is, you know, well, why, you know, what is the point of, um, I don't know, the UK doing something when China isn't doing as much as it should? And, and you know, what's, what's the answer to that one? Um, well, first of all, China is doing an awful lot. Um, again, it's very easy in the press to have a downer on China. China are rapidly decarbonizing way more rapidly than any other industrial economy. It's much harder for them because they've got a very big economy. They've got a very large population, but they are going faster than anyone else. Um, and President Xi isn't in Glasgow, but I know for a fact he's got 250, yes, 250 negotiators in Glasgow trying to get the right deal. And you don't hear that reported either. But your question is still valid, Richard. So a little country like the UK, tiny emitter compared to China and the US and Russia and Brazil, what difference can we make? We can make a difference by showing how this can work. So. Here in the UK, we have a financial services sector that's waking up to the need to finance this transition. And we have innovation that is part of this, you know, some of the technical solutions. So what the UK can do is to kind of show the art of the possible, is to show what this can look like in a way that others then can then scale and replicate. So to be honest, I'm more worried about India. I'm more worried about Brazil. Um, I'm not actually worried about China at all um, because China, China is also renowned for its long-term thinking. They worked this out way before many other governments did because you know, they think in 50 year time horizons, they've understood the science for a long time. But I suppose also my answer to the question is, what have we got to lose? So the worst that can happen is we don't deliver the change that we need to deliver and the rest of the world doesn't replicate what's happening in Europe. Europe has got a fabulous EU Green New Deal. The worst that can happen is we don't get there. If we do nothing, then the worst will definitely happen. Yeah. Yes, that's a fair point. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so coming back to, to one of the comments you made about individuals, and there are some questions in the chat around that. What can individuals do that yes. will be constructive? Yes, um, lots, lots and lots and lots and lots. Um, so again, I had a little think about this. First of all, where is your food coming from? Where is it produced? Do you have a balanced diet in terms of meat and plant so meat consumption you know it does make sense in some contexts because actually um cattle are really good at grazing and in some contexts that makes a lot of sense but if you're buying a load of imported meat with all that heavy carbon footprint that makes less sense so where and how your food is made is a big part of your sort of own carbon story um Equally, where and how you buy your clothes and how long do you keep your clothes? Um, I don't think anyone in this call necessarily is buying t-shirts for a pound and wearing them only once and then sticking them into landfill. But honestly, that has been a massive contributor to the issues that we face right now. So where and how your clothes are made, um, how do you get about? Active transport, walking, cycling, public transport. If you've got a car, is it a hybrid? Um, is it there aren't that many electric cars actually hybrid is pretty good um heating um at the moment that's tough for us particularly in london <laughs> the logistics of putting in ground source heat pumps are, you know they're way beyond the the realm of mo most of us but we can insulate our homes we can make sure that actually as we're heating our homes they're pretty energy efficient um and then this is something that we don't talk about enough who have you got your mortgage with if you have a mortgage who's got your pension Who's got your savings? Because actually a lot of us have got money invested and we probably haven't asked where it's invested that in the past has been propping up oil and gas. So use 
that pound that you've got either borrowed or invest in, because honestly, that could be amazingly powerful. Also, buy a couple of shares in these fossil fuel industry and become a become a, an activist shareholder. Become a pain in the bum annual general meetings. Ask about where's your low carbon transition plan. So that might be too much for most people to be honest. That sort of thing I do. Um, you don't all have to do that. But seriously, when you look at ask your pension advisor where is your money invested. Move it into the stocks of the future. Move it out of these fossil fuel industries and other industries that are, you know, perpetuating our alliance on, on oil and gas. Um, you can also get out and march. But as I said earlier, I don't think we all need to be climate activists. And some people feel this incredible pressure. And to be honest, switching your pension fund is probably a really important thing that everybody can do right now. Um, and I guess the last thing is don't beat yourself up. That's not very good either. Um, there's so much we can all do, so much we can celebrate. Um, but if you look at where you're buying your food, where you're buying your clothes, how you're getting about, how you're heating your home, how well your home is insulated, where are you, where is your money, who are you borrowing off, who you're saving with, and have a voice with your local authority. If we all did that, that would be amazing. Actually, you, you, on, on the local authority side, one question we had was, what's the most effective thing an individual can do to influence the local council and also national government to make changes faster? We've actually got um, on the call, we've got uh, the Wandsworth Council's uh, climate change lead, Andrew Haggis, so I'm sure he'd be interested to hear the answer to that one. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can obviously make your voice heard. But I think for us as citizens to make it clear that we care about this agenda and this is about votes. So particularly for you know, regional and national politicians, I think one of the reasons the political will hasn't been there in the way that it should have been, not so much at a local level, actually, the political will is often stronger at a local level. One of the reasons at a national level is people don't think there were votes in it. Um, and actually, if we can, communicate there are votes in this because we do really care and you know nobody wants a government that's not taking the action that they need to take and making it clear that this is about votes and um, everyone does have a voice and you know what was extraordinary in Glasgow over the weekend I've seen the pictures all these people out marching that really matters um, so I think making it clear that this is something that you care about and making that voice heard is, is super important. I think, you know, Wandsworth does a good job of that. Um, obviously there's the series of events this, this week, but I, I think in the end, it is about persistence and agency and advocacy. Um, I mean, there is a role for, kind of you know gluing yourself to a road perhaps I'm less convinced about that um I'm not sure I support insulate but I'm not sure I support that really I think you know I'm, I ran into two extension rebellion marches last week they were incredibly peaceful they were incredibly structured their message was clear people listened um a lot of your dealings, Sally, are with multinationals. Um, you know, you've told us some stories that, you know, about your interactions, you know, with CEOs of, you know, big companies. Um, <clears throat> one of the questions, one of the comments that's been made is that, you know, basically a lot of the uh, damage to the planet and the carbon footprint is, you know, from multinationals. And we're not just talking about um, oil and gas. No. I mean, do you... Uh, do you see that they are changing? I mean, the, the person who's asking the question was basically being very pessimistic about their ability to change. Yes, yeah, um, they are changing um, simply because there is no business on a dead planet. There just isn't. And we've now got a wave of investors coming through that weren't there even two years ago that have worked out something called value at risk. And the value at risk from climate is really significant. And 
that has been probably the most important shift that's happened over the last 18 months, which is investors are now asking they weren't asking. So years ago, you, you if you think about any change, you've always got the pioneers or you actually can't use that word anymore. It's got colonialist tendencies, the trailblazers. Um, you have to be really careful. So um, you've always got the trailblazers that are kind of, you know, right at the edge of change. And yeah, there haven't been very many multinationals in that category, but that number is increasing because investor pressure is real right now. And it, and it really wasn't, as I said, until quite recently. And I don't know if you saw a lot of the announcements last week from London, London Stock Exchange, um, capital markets, it's becoming increasingly hard for a multinational to duck this issue, um, simply because it makes no financial sense if you've got a business that's completely reliant on fossil fuels, partly because at the moment, on some days, the price of solar and wind is less than fossil fuels. We've reached price parity and we're actually, we're crossing over. So it doesn't make any sense from a business point of view. Um, now, that is good, but I think probably what the comment in the chat refers to is, again, we talked about political will. What about the will of the people at the top? And going back to my number one reason as to why we're in this mess, vested interests. And I think this is the kind of moment in time. Um, and I talk about this a lot at the moment, but I, I feel it viscerally in the we're at a crossroads. We can either go down the path of deep transformation and rewire the economy to drive a zero carbon future, or we can just keep trying incremental change. And I think incre an increasing number of multinationals are working out that we have to go down the deep transformation path. But there's a great quote, um, traveller, the road we want hasn't been trodden yet, and it hasn't. So, you know, it, it's very complex, it's very hard. So my own view is you will always have a clutch of multinationals that will just be late adopters. And to be honest, if they stop lobbying, that's enough for me. Um, they will follow the market. But the number of organisations, and one of the reasons why... Um, Again, I think two reasons for optimism COP, three actually, can I remember them all? One is the availability of private sector finance that I talked about earlier. The second is that this COP sector presence ever. So the private sector are saying to government, this is what we need. The third reason is you've got people out marching in the streets saying, you've got to do something. And that is making a difference. So. I think for that reason, you've got a portion of the private sector that see themselves as part of the solution. You've got a portion that think it's nothing to do with me. And then you've got a portion that think over my dead body, I'm not going to do this. But I think that those organisations that have looked into the future, very much like China has and has figured out, unless we transform really quite fundamentally, yeah, we might drive a profit in the next five years, maybe even eight years, but not more than that. And then it comes down to individual will because CEO life ten life ten life span yeah, life tenure is maybe five to eight years. Ooh, interesting. That's why you need the board to get behind because you can't just rely on a visionary CEO because they won't be there for that long. Ooh, interesting. Well, let's hope you're around for a long time. <laughs> So uh, sort of coming back to local government, and, and as we mentioned, Andrew Hagar, the um, Wandsworth Council climate change lead, is on the call. And it might be very interesting if we could just hear from, from Andrew for a moment what he feels that Wandsworth are doing or could do better, how we can help the council to do better. Um, so, Andrew, if you're there and uh, willing to come in and just say something that would be very helpful I think nice for people to know who you are as well so welcome 
Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for having me here. It's really great to hear from Sally, actually. There's some um, fantastic points, and, and I agree with pretty much everything you're saying there um, in terms of the, the need for action and, and the, the talking about that system-wide change. And I think in terms of what we're doing, I think we started by declaring climate emergency, which we thought was very important to put it front and centre that, that this is important and we are committed to doing something and we set ourselves a target around our own operations and what we control. So we said we're going to be carbon neutral by 2030 as an organisation. So that means that we're going to reduce our carbon emissions and, and have it so it's a balance so that anything we are emitting we will offset but the aim is to reduce our emissions as much as possible. And it, it's part of kind of setting an example and and walking the walk. So we said we're going to, going to do something and, and we've set ourselves, ourselves this target of, of doing something about it. Um, so in order to do that, we um, we buy renewable electricity as a whole organisation. Um, that's that's a very, e for most people, it's an, it's an easy switch for a very large organisation. It's not quite that simple, um, but it, we've done that now. And, and that's a big step forward in terms of making sure that we are putting our money in the right place when we're buying electricity and you know, we buy millions of pounds worth of electricity every year. So that's a big statement. And we were actually one of the first sort of councils to do that because we were having conversations with our energy supplier and they were saying, sort of, nobody's asked us before. How, we don't know how to do this. So we had to kind of say like, well, this is what we want. And also lots of people are going to be asking you for this. Lots of councils are going to be asking you for this in a couple of months time. So let's get on it. Um, Andrew, uh, so, um, Andrew, I don't want to cut you off, but there's an awful yeah. lot of questions. I'm yeah, sorry, I, know, I was sorry. just hoping for a very quick um, sort of yes. overview, as it were. Um, yeah, sorry, so I'm going to appreciate that. Going um, into far too much detail, but um, but, but, but maybe we'll get you back another day to to expand on this. People yeah, might be very interested. Um, but but we do have quite a lot of people who've asked questions of, yes. of Sally here. So um, if that's okay, mm -hmm. um, I don't want to cut you off in your prime. <laughs> But I'm going to. <laughs> um, so, Sally, we do have uh, I know you've answered quite a few of the, the questions, really. But um, and I think, you know, so at COP, what have you been encouraged by and what are your main disappointments? I think you've sort of alluded to some of that. So I am. Um, and, and I think, you know, how positive or negative you feel. Um, so I think we, we've dealt with the questions around what you feel government and, and um, population behaviour. Um, someone has said that, uh, in fact, that's Andrew, <laughs> fascinated by the potential of the circular economy. So he's yeah. wondering what, what you think of the opportunities for that. Oh, enormous. Absolutely enormous. Um, so the circular economy, effectively an economy where someone else's waste becomes someone else's raw material input. And it, we often call this kind of closing the loop. So at the moment, you know, we lose a lot of resources into landfill. We know about that. But also, you know, we don't quite have the ability to take back everything that we've put into into the system. And there are massive innovations happening in this space. It is part of the answer. It's not the total answer though, because that's about keeping the flows in the system, but we need to bring the resources going into the system down. But you know, there are some fabulous things happening um, you know, around say, for example, recycled aluminium. So aluminium has got huge integrity. You just keep recycling it, but at the moment, um, aluminium manufacturers can't get the cans back so this is where we really need a concerted effort to put in infrastructures you know Andrew we're really familiar with this story um but it, it's why again we need the private sector to work with the government because that's how you get the infrastructure in place but the circular economy offers huge opportunity just to keep the resources in in the system from you know plastics um through to food waste becoming um in input for uh, fuel sources, um, you know, through to you know food uh, food waste becoming you know jams and chutneys. Um, this it, the the mindset here is, and it's very much the mindset that my dad had after the Second World War is, you know, why throw anything away? Um, and I've got a bit of that, and it drives my family totally nuts because I don't throw anything away. Um, but it's that kind of 
mindset that says, you know, I value everything um, and I'm going to just keep wearing my clothes until they fall apart. Um, and I'm going to, you know, just get the most utility out of everything that I have. And I don't think there's enough of that at the moment, but, you know, a, a truly circular economy means that, um, you know, the amount of carbon we're using is drastic, drastically reduced, the amount of waste we're producing is drastically reduced. And there's something called industrial ecology, which is, you know, the outputs from one process are the inputs into the other. And you've got um, cities around the UK really experimenting with this, trying to bring the circular, circular economy to life on a, on a city basis. Um, I, I, I get the sense that the messaging, that political messaging has started to change and become more positive. I mean, up to now, there's been very much, you know, doom and gloom. You know, we're going to have, you know, floods and famine and, you know, the world is burning and all that. And it, I mean, it's true, but it does tend to turn people off. Whereas if the messaging is more, you know, if we do this, then, you know, things will be better and, you know, we'll all be better off. Uh, it is more likely to sort of get people behind what needs to happen. Yeah, I mean, this is where I think the Green Movement got things wrong in the, certainly in the 90s. I mean, the kind of depiction of a sustainable lifestyle was the broad equivalent of, I'd like you to go and live in a cave, please, with a candle and just eat muesli. That is what is a sustainable lifestyle. Didn't really attract kind of mass following. Um, Whereas if you think about, so I was at, um, I came back from Glasgow to host a conference on green tech on Friday. And it was, um, it's, a, it's um, a conference which is backed by um, the Formula One, right? Formula One, Nico Rosber. Yeah, got it. Um, anyway, he's putting his money that he's made through Formula One into all this technology. And suddenly living a sustainable lifestyle can be really chic and, you can have all this innovation because digital technology has come on so much. And so this notion of sustainable lifestyle is all about sacrifice. That didn't help at all. And actually it doesn't have to be with digital technology. We can really cut carbon, we can cut waste, we can get access to tools and information that we couldn't before. And, um, you know, the innovation that's coming into the green tech space is phenomenal. And also uh, one of the speakers at this conference um, had the performance over the last three years of standard industries and green tech industries. And guess what? Green tech is outperforming standard industry by, by a mile. Um, so this is technology coming through, which means that, you know, it isn't the equivalent of sort of putting on, you know, hemp cloth and being miserable. We can actually live low carbon, zero carbon lifestyles and then use technology one thing but also that's why I love Julia Richard what you're doing and others on the call with the common because you know conserving our common is something really practically that will make a difference trees sequester carbon um so there's so much we can do that creates positivity creates energy creates cohesion creates community resilience um and we just have to flip the narrative a bit and, and that brings us very neatly to another question that we had for you, Sally, is that um, obviously, as you know, we do try very hard to in encourage our members and our users and everyone generally to, to really appreciate and understand how important the common is, so all green space. So, you know, so far our contribution has been, well, engaging users, uh, tree planting, getting drinking fountains in so that um, people don't bring, hopefully, plastic bottles, but... Um, Andrew, take note of this, please. We really need better social media and, and the council to broadcast drinking fountains because I spoke to all the footballers starting uh, at the weekend and they had no idea there were fountains. No one had told them. So we really need the council to spread the word about things like that. And ditto, we now have some recycling bins as a pilot. So, Sally, a question for you is what else should we be doing? What can we and our yeah. members also focus on? What else... You know, what else can we do related to our green spaces? You've talked yeah. about what individuals can do at home. I mean, you're doing a lot. Um, so I had to think really hard about this question. Um, and I guess I thought about well, a couple of things. So first is, are there 
I, I mean, I think you already do this, but how can you leverage um, partnerships more, say, with local businesses and, you know, the ones with common and local businesses then bid for funding to accelerate the transition of areas of Wandsworth from reliance on the grid to community energy. So there are lots of foundations emerging that are really interested in community energy and want to use community energy as a way of building resilience. And so you could imagine um, the dream here would, you know, Northcote Road is purely PV, it's, you know, photovoltaic, photovoltaic cells. And kind of, I haven't seen any community energy schemes in the Southwest London area, and they're certainly working in many other parts of, of the UK. So could a partnership with local business to accelerate moves to community energy? I mean, you know, Andrew will know how to do that, but I've seen it work really, really well in other parts of the UK. So that's not something about ones with common itself, but it's about the influence that the common can have on how energy is used in, in, in Wandsworth. Um, so, you know, where are those partnerships that give you access to funding that allow accelerated transition to zero carbon Wandsworth? That was kind of one, one area where I went in my thinking. And then I also wondered about, you know, how might these green spaces in London be more than the sum of their individual parts? So there's probably is a sort of green spaces network in London. There certainly was one of my first projects when I was working as a consultant before I joined Forum was um, surveying the health of trees in London as an indicator of, of their quality. And there were there were green networks there. I don't I don't know whether we can sort of breathe life into that and sort of you know, is there amplification of some of the messages that you're driving through ones with common by working, I think you do it with Clapham actually, but, you know, throughout the sort of London area, how, how can these green spaces join together and punch above their weight in terms of their individual voice? Um, so I get, my mind went to sort of collaboration and partnerships because I think in terms of, so any organisation, right, you've got your direct sphere of influence. I think you're doing really well there. I think you, in terms of the things you directly control really well. So my mind went, went into that indirect sphere of influence, where there's partnerships, collaborations that allow money to come through to allow rapid transition to net zero, allow collaboration with other green spaces to kind of, you know, amplify the message that these spaces are part of the solution. You know, they build biodiversity, they sequester carbon, Oh, and by the way, they make you feel good because one of the impacts of climate change is eco-anxiety, is mental health stress. And so this, again, takes us back to that intersection of climate and health and green spaces are where it becomes real. Very interesting, Sally. And, and you will be pleased to know that we do actually link with our neighbours and indeed the chair of Wandsworth Park. Uh, it, it, a friends group is, is on the call tonight. Um, so we have a Wandsworth uh, user group forum, so a green spaces forum, and actually we also link into the London wide uh, friends group, uh, which pre pandemic met at City Hall actually, but has been meet. So there is cross fertilization, but I think I'm sure Pat would agree we could do it better. And uh, we, we had a forum meeting only this morning to discuss to discuss that. So I think climate change could could go on our agenda as well because you know we perhaps think too too focused. Um, a, a couple of comments in the chat. Um, so somebody was, was questioning whether uh, Wandsworth were investing in fossil fuels and Andrew has answered that saying um, they're switching from, from um, uh, investment in um, moving investments away from fossil fuels, reducing the carbon intensity of the pension fund overall. So um, and he's put a link if anyone is interested into how that is being done. And also a couple of people um, have mentioned a, uh, a, a, I think it's a website. Um, I'm just trying to find it. Scrolling up and down the chat is making me feel slightly nauseous because I'm having to do it. And there's a lot of questions. Talk. There's an awful lot of chat and questions, but there's um, uh, a website called Carbon Place. Um, do you have a comment on how useful that is? Do you know it? I, I'm not. There's quite a few websites like that, and they they all are really great at sort of giving practical yes. advice. Um, yes. 
are there any you would recommend particularly or apps you know how how you can measure your own carbon footprint in other words where your food comes up you know what's the yeah. carbon footprint of all your actions really oh yes that takes me back um <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I was involved in a project, um, I think it was 15 years ago, to put carbon labels on food. And my involvement was really to say, I don't know why we're doing this, because this is pretty impossible to do it with any degree of accuracy. Um, so it was where, uh, about the time that Tesco said it was going to put carbon labels on all products, and it did, it put a carbon la label on Walker's Chris. And of course, it meant nothing to anybody. Um, but actually, yeah, I don't, I'm sure, I don't actually have a, an app for my carbon footprint. I really should do that. But there are loads out there now, um, which is the wonder of smartphones and these digital applications. But to be honest, going back to what, I, it's not rocket science. You know, if if you, you know, balance your diet, eat plant-based proteins, um, eat locally sourced meat, um, you know, if you're, making choices when you're buying your clothes and asking you know is this sustainable cotton not conventional cotton these are big you know these will make a big difference so i personally i think kind of individual carbon counts they're useful to a point and then you just end up sort of tying yourself in knots um a bit like calorie counting which is a bit pointless <laughs> Well, as I was just about to say, I didn't want to offend anybody, um, but you kind of, you know, the big ticket items and it's, you know, I, I, it's useful, but it's not sufficient because it is about your mindset. It's about saying, you know, I'm going to embrace this way of being and, um, and yeah, just those big ticket items that we're only now beginning to understand, you can make a massive difference. Great. Um, you were encouraging us to um, interact with local businesses. We actually had an interaction with a local business even this morning. Um, it was actually very encouraging. So, um, you know, on our morning coffee hunt, we uh, were talking to the proprietor of a local coffee shop. And we were saying, to, and he came to us sort of saying, you know, I've got this big idea to, you know, basically encourage all, um, all the coffee shops to have you know, compostable and did our, you know, um, yes, biodegradable, biodegradable. Coffee. And so we say to him, no, the problem is that however compostable and biodegradable your coffee cups are, they end up on ones with common in the ordinary litter bins. So how are we actually going to, um, cause that'll be incinerated. How are we going to address that problem? Yeah. So we got him thinking about that. And, uh, anyway, he's thinking about it, but, 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 but I mean, coffee cups, you know, they cannot be recycled. There's now so much re um, compostable stuff being produced, it's going to overwhelm. And you know, unless you've got a compost heap, how, how yeah. do you compost it? So, you know, you know, recycling bins don't take coffee cups. No one knows what to do with coffee cups. So do, do you think, I mean, his idea was rather a good one, that, that, that we get a, a bin for the middle of the common where wherever you bought your coffee, if it's in a if it's in a takeaway cup, if you really must get a single use cup, if you can't use a, a reusable one, that, that it, they could all be put in there and then recycled. I mean, you know, he was one cafe and he said they get through 500 a day. That's mm. one cafe on one road surrounding the common. You yeah. imagine how many coffees there are on Bellevue Road and Northcote Road. And that's just one green space and every other. I mean. Is it uh, our coffee cups? Are, uh, they look like a big problem. Um, I mean, yes and no. Um, I think it's important sometimes to feel at an individual level you're making a difference and an active choice in the grand scheme of things. Where your pension sits would be, you know, have a, have a much bigger impact. But I think what's really nice about that idea is it's in line with the social economy it's making it's normalizing that behavior which is there is no way there really isn't any way um you know we have if we produce something we have to get rid of it um and so kind of normalizing that and creating a societal norm where we don't throw things away and we expect another end of use life i think that is really important that's a behavioral shift that 
that needs to happen. Um, and to be honest, COVID didn't do us any favours because we were on a great trajectory before COVID um, with people in their recycled cups. It was actually becoming a societal norm um, here in Europe. And we've that, you know, COVID has had upsides from an environmental perspective, but that's been a definite downside. Um, so I think we need to keep pushing on this, um, but kind of, you know, in that coffee shop where his energy is coming from and where he's sourcing his coffee from um probably going to be more impactful and actually we did discuss that with him and said you know and where he sources the coffee cup i said you know can you say that they've been um, um manufactured in a carbon friendly way <laughs> you know yeah so. i mean this this you know you can get um yeah i mean i think this one, i just saw them flash on the chat read for one's worth this Honestly, if you put your mind to it now, it's so much easier than it was even two years ago. So, you know, if you can reduce the carbon footprint of the cup, if you can somehow find a way of taking it back, then we start to get that circular economy moving, um, which, as we discussed earlier, is definitely part of the solution. Yes. And um, uh, Amy uh, on the chat uh, so she's doing a talk on Thursday evening on refill. Presumably that's part of the climate change um, festival, Amy, is it? Anyway. Yes. So we've got a very quick answer to that. So for those of you who haven't signed up to other sessions, ha have a look on the on the uh, council website and... Um, It'll, it'll tell you what other sessions. So Amy's session is Thursday evening talking about refill. And there are local shops that, that have plastic free, yeah. um, which is brilliant, isn't it, Sally? You know, yeah, can, and you yeah. know, bulk dispensers. Um, yeah. And you take your own bags or they just give you paper bags. And, you know, we go up with, with old jerry cans and things and we fill everything from body lotion and shampoo to tahini and olive oil and everything you don't have to buy a new bottle of anything anymore. we do our weightlifting at the same time on the yes, we walk it home. Um, another a, a, a final probably because we, yes, are, we must let you go yes. um, but ones with related because i can remember you know five years ago um asking the uh, cabinet member for recycling you know what about food waste collections mm. And the argument was, and this shows you how complicated these calculations yes. can be. Basically, yes, um, if you could do it in a you know in a low carbon way, she said, but basically we would have to put on another uh, you know collection round, which obviously has a carbon footprint. So, but anyway, they've now started a pilot scheme in Southfields. Oh, so actually, a comp I think it's com home composting. Andrew's yeah. got a, a link to it on the yeah. The yeah. green bin so trial. what's your what's your view about food waste um well, well first of all don't create it yeah no absolutely um <laughs> you know that hierarchy is avoid the waste in the first place but clearly sometimes that's not um that's unavoidable but you can imagine you know electric vehicles um that i mean we're getting close now to an electric vehicle fleet so if you've removed the carbon emissions from the collection then suddenly it starts to become Mm -hmm. a lot more viable um, and there are lots of industrial applications that take food waste as a primary energy energy source so I think we're just in this incredible transition space at the moment so we're experimenting and some things aren't working um, so food waste collection where you're reliant on a vehicle transport fleet that's guzzling diesel that makes no sense whatsoever mm -hmm. but food waste collection where you've got EVs and it's being collected to be an energy source for you know some kind of heat provider then that does make sense and so you know that's what I would I guess suppose, yeah we are at time but that's probably mm -hmm. a kind of final reflection which is this is messy at the moment we don't have all the answers and that path isn't trodden and so some things that are happening are just you know they're not going to work and that's fine we just need to learn from that and adapt and pivot and and as humans we're, we're not great at dealing with complexity we're not really very good at adapting um you know it's just not one of our strengths and I think that the next three to five years will require all of us to be better at living with uncertainty pivoting really quickly look 
look what we did in a pandemic we moved really really quickly we can continue to do that so I think we need to accept it's messy accept some things won't work accept we'll all make some bad decisions along the way but if we've got that goal of a sustainable future and if we really accept that the future isn't something that just happens to us. It's absolutely something we can create. It's within the gift of all of us on this call. And if we can be bold and ambitious, accept the messiness, accept we're in a, you know, from a systems point of view, we're in accelerated systemic change. It's called accelerated systems transition. That's why it feels so bloody messy, because it is. Just live with it, go with it, and we might get there. Well, that's a wonderful note to end on, Sally. And I think... Um, everyone would agree with me to say that was an absolutely fascinating chat tonight and we are all so grateful because we know you're busy you've got a huge remit you're trying to get transformational change in huge industries and at government level so you can unmute yourselves and um you know we'll all give sally a big thank you very much indeed oh, you're welcome it's absolutely I'm... marvelous yeah and we will um, pass on any of the, the questions that, yeah. that we didn't get around to asking to you and, yes um, and, and, and go on, Sally. So on. No, I was going to say, and you know where I live, so you can make sure. Oh, we do. <laughs> Sally lives almost opposite us, so it's quite handy for for dinner party discussions. So we're we're very lucky to have our own uh, street environmentalist, I have to say, which is marvellous for us. And um, I'd like to thank all our. Um, guests tonight on the call and for your fantastic interactional contributions and so many questions on the chat and and so many thoughts and suggestions actually and we will email people with the links and things that people have um, put on the chat and 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 a lot of people have said thank you and 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 maddie riddell has said uh, and good luck this week so we're all behind thank you. you and um we you know we wish you all the best and thank you very much indeed and for everybody else this call is recorded so if you need to listen to any of it again it will be on our website in due course and um, do encourage people to sign up to other sessions from the um, from the council climate change week their festival great and you can email us with any questions so sally thank you so much for your time we're all really thank you thank see you, you soon and good night Bye. everybody and